I've been uh, following the Ukrainian conflict pretty closely. I'm a bit of a history buff, and I, I think history is being made there. It's a, it's a pretty historic couple of years uh, that's been going on. Um, but what I really like about history is the battles that go on. I used to, I, I still do often, just watch battle maps, look at battle maps, see how things progress, uh, see what uh, strategies were used. And what's, what's pretty common, and this has shown up in the Ukrainian conflict especially, is this, this idea that an advancing army will go forward and the first thing they'll do is they'll clear the land, they'll remove all the trees, they'll make sure that there's line of sight, they'll lay some landmines, put up some barbed wire and some you know, really rudimentary watch posts, stuff that's really easy, quick to build. And then, when they spend a bit longer having advanced in their new territory, they'll dig some trenches, they'll establish some communication posts, medical stations and supply depots. And then when they get to spend you know, upwards of a year, they really sort of dig down and build some impressive fortifications like concrete walls, dragon's teeth to stop tanks, sandbagging, concrete and gun emplacements. And I, and I like to think of the creeds as serving a, a fairly similar purpose. What we see in the week one was that the Apostles' Creed sort of serves as the, the ground cover. This is where you know, the, the, the lines are staked out. This is where Christianity begins. Um, or at least, or heresy begins. Um, and then last week, we looked at the Nicene Creed. That, that sort of is a bit more filling in some more cracks, getting rid of some more heresies, just sort of um, building up the dam a little better. And then this week, we get to the heavy-duty fortifications, you know, the gun emplacements. This is the, the real hard-hitting stuff. This is where it gets serious. This is where theology really hits the road. Um, this week we're looking at the Athanasian Creed. This probably wasn't written by Athanasius. He was a 4th century bishop in Alexandrina, but this was probably written after his death. Um, and it was written to sort of fight against the Arians. We talked about these, this group last week, I think. Um, they believed that Jesus wasn't co-eternal with God. He, they believed he was a created being, um, not eternal and equally God, that he was subordinate to the Father. And so this, this creed sort of really um, finally shores up, I think, with, that, with pretty, pretty solid certainty um, what like essentially, yeah, just sort of really nails Arianism in the head, if you <laughs> take my drift. Um, this week, this, this creed, what it looks at is this sort of critical points of Christian theology. That's the unity of the two essences of Christ. We'll, we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. But Essentially, what the creed is, there's, there's three questions that the creed is answering. The first one is, how God is Jesus? Is he, is he a little bit God? Is he mostly God? Is he most somewhat God? Like, is he, you know, or is he all God? Is he fully God? Is he 100% God? The second question is, how human is Jesus? Is he just a human with God dwelling in him? Is he just a puppet? Um, or is he fully human? And what the, the, through the creed con, um, concludes is that he's both. He is perfectly God, perfectly human, and that it matters. This, this, and the third question is, why does it matter? And that's, we'll look at that. But it is, I think, one of the most fundamental doctrines of Christian theology for the gospel. We need to understand this if we're going to understand the true significance of the gospel. So most of you would have a handout. If you don't have a handout, pop your hand up and Harold will get one to you. I see one up there, one there. Um, then we're going to read through it. This one is long compared to the other two we've done. Uh, this one is going to be, uh, uh, yeah, it's, been, it's a bit of a journey, this one. So we'll take our time, we'll go through it. Um, from what I could see, even churches that follow a liturgical calendar that goes through the creeds regularly, they still only do it once a year. It's, it's a long creed. But I think it's one of the most beautiful pieces of written, of Christian theology written in history, I would argue. Um, so now that everyone's got one, we'll start. All right, we'll read it all together out loud. Oh, and one quick thing. The word Catholic comes up a few times throughout this thing. If you, if you haven't been here the last two weeks, the word Catholic, when in terms of historical context, just means universal church. It, is the, it just means to be Christian. It's the Christian church, you could supplement that, or the universal church, um, if, you, if you want to be more comfortable with that language. But Catholic just means to be Christian. 
<laughs> all right, let's start. Whoever desires to be saved should, above all, hold to the Catholic faith. Anyone who does not keep it whole and unbroken will doubtless perish eternally. Now, this is the Catholic faith, that we worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity, neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence. For the person of the Father is a distinct person, the person of the Son is another, and that of the Holy Spirit still another. But the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, their glory equal, their majesty co-eternal. What quality the Father has, the Son has, and the Holy Spirit has. The Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated, the Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is immeasurable, the Son is immeasurable, the Holy Spirit is immeasurable. The Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal. And yet, there are not three eternal beings. There is but one eternal being. So too, there are not three uncreated or immeasurable beings. There is but one uncreated and immeasurable being. Similarly, the Father is almighty. The Son is almighty. The Holy Spirit is almighty. Yet there are not three almighty beings. There is but one almighty being. Thus the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Yet there are not three gods, there is but one God. Thus the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. Yet there are not three lords, there is but one Lord. Just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually as both God and Lord, so Catholic religion forbids us to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father has made, neither made nor created, nor begotten from anyone. The Son was neither made nor created. He was begotten from the Father alone. The Holy Spirit was neither made nor created, nor begotten. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. Accordingly, there is one Father, not three fathers. There is one Son, not three sons. There is one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. Nothing in this trinity is before or after. Nothing is greater or smaller in their entirety. The three persons are co-eternal and co-equal with each other. So in everything, as was said earlier, we must worship their trinity in their unity and their unity in their trinity. Anyone then who desires to be saved should think thus about the trinity. But it is necessary for eternal salvation that one also believe in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ faithfully. Now this is the true faith, that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and human equally. He is God from the essence of the Father, begotten before time, and he is human from the essence of his mother, born in time, completely God, completely human, with a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father as regards divinity, less than the Father as regards humanity. Although he is God and human, yet Christ is not two, but one. He is one, however, not by his divinity being turned into flesh, but by God taking humanity to himself. He is one, certainly not by the blending of his essence, but by the unity of his person. For just as one person is both rational soul and flesh, so too the one Christ is both God and human. He suffered for our salvation. He descended to the dead. He arose from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the Father's right hand. For there he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will rise bodily and give an account of their own deeds. Those who have done good will enter eternal life, and those who have done evil will enter eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. One cannot be saved without believing it firmly and faithfully. Wowee, it's long, isn't it? <laughs> now, I've divided this into, you'll see that there's numbers on the side and two parts. There's part one, part two. 
that's just for clarity. It's for me to be able to tell you where to look rather than look on page one about two thirds down. Um, I've added those numbers, not, they're not, um, I guess, native to the creed. Um, but part one is answering this question, how God is Jesus? And the Athanasian Creed goes to incredible lengths to prove that all three members of the Trinity are equally God. And to prove this fact, it looks at the characteristics that are intrinsic to Godhood. Um, if we remember from the creeds, the last two creeds we've done, that it's often responding to heresies. And we see in paragraphs three and four a refutation of two key heresies that have popped up over church history. The first is modalism or Sabellianism. Um, this is the idea that God is one person, manifesting in three different modes. So, for instance, in the Old Testament, he's showing himself as God the Father, and then in the New Testament, he rocks up as God the Son, and then post, um, post Jesus' ascension, we see that God operates as the Holy Spirit. Um, but this is a denial of the interpersonal relationship of the Trinity. It's saying that it's just one person doing three different things at different times, showing a different aspect of himself, but it's still just one person. And they do have some, some verses that they try to rely on. Um, for example, in John 10, um, 10, 30, it says, I and the Father are one. Um, or in John 14, it says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or Colossians 2.9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So they argued from these passages that God is just one single person, just manifesting in different ways. Um, he shows himself one way and then in another and then in another. Um, the problem is that this interpretation doesn't account for the just overwhelming amounts of scripture that, that highlight the different persons of the, father, of the Godhood. Um, it, it just The Bible is so comprehensively against a modalistic interpretation. Um, if you look at Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, this is Jesus' baptism. It says, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. All three members of the Trinity are present here. It's, it's logically impossible for, for the Father to be talking himself. That just doesn't, that doesn't add up, does it? Um, or in John 14, we have the promise of the Spirit. Um, it says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. So the word another demonstrates that the Spirit is distinct from Jesus or from the Father. Um, and the very fact that Jesus is asking the Father, it would be like asking himself, which is just illogical. Um, so the Athanasian Creed goes to great detail, demonstrating the ways in which the Trinity is, is different, that, they're, that they're, they're the personhoods share an essence but are distinct persons. Um, we need to understand the word essence, I think. Um, it's, it comes up a lot in the creeds and throughout church history. Uh, but it's, the sense, essence essentially refers to what is our funda the fundamental nature of a thing, um, the whatness of something, what makes it truly what it is. Think of the most essence as the most defining characteristics of something. Um, for that to make, for the Trinity, the essence is the divine nature. Um, so while the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons, they are fully and equally God because they share in the same essence. So a rock, for example, um, the characteristics or the essence of what makes a rock a rock, um, you might look at things like the hardness or its solid structure or its mineral makeup, um, you know, the qualities that separate it from a plant or an animal. It doesn't have to look like every other rock you've ever seen to still be a rock if it still shares those fundamental characteristics. It doesn't have to have the same color. It doesn't have to be the same shape or the same size. As long as it has those unchanging, definable qualities, it's still a rock. Um, so when we talk about the essence of God, we're talking about the definable and definitive characteristics that make God, God. And so the Athanasian Creed does this really wonderful job defining and clarifying these, these fundamental characteristics of what makes God, God. This is why I think the Athanasian Creed is, is one of the most magnificent pieces of literature in Christian history. Um, 
I don't think it's I, like I don't think that one sermon does justice to it. I think this is one of those things that I think is worth coming back and meditating on and meditating on as we think more about who God is and what his nature is. Because, I mean, if, if I could capture it in 30 minutes, I don't think that would capture the eternal God particularly well. Um, but if you look at, at paragraph 6, it says that God is immeasurable, the Father is immeasurable, the Son is immeasurable, the Holy Spirit is immeasurable. These are intrinsic characteristics of Godhood. Psalm 147 says, Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Or Job 11 says, Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? It's longer than the earth and broader than the sea. God is almighty and eternal. All three persons share that. Paragraphs 7, 8, and 9 highlight the eternal, uncreated, and almightiness of God. All three uh, are, uh, share this idea that, um, that yeah, these, the, these characteristics, they highlight the different aspects of them. But Revelation 1, 8 captures all three of this in one little verse. It says, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who was and is and is to come. So he's the beginning and the end. He is almighty. He is before creation. So he, he precedes creativity, so he must be uncreated. Another passage that highlights this idea is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. It says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He, like When we're talking about God, we often fall into this we have to define things in negatives. He's unreachable. He's unsearchable. He's unending. Like, because if you try to put him in a box, that sort of breaks, I think. And we see this throughout the Bible, that all three of the Godhood, all three members of the Godhood, share in these fundamental characteristics. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all eternal. They're all immeasurable. They're all uncreated. And they are all almighty. So fundamental to godness is this nature of eternal eternality, immeasurability, uncreatedness, and almighty. So the Athanasian Creed does a really good job drawing this conclusion. If you look at paragraph 10, it says, The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God, because all three share in the characteristics that make God, God. So you can't be God without these characteristics. You can't not be God and have these characteristics. Um, so based on that logic, all three members of the Trinity are God. All three are worthy of honour. All three are worthy of praise, glory and worship. The second heresy that this um, beginning part of the creed combats is tritheism. This is a different heresy to modalism um, because it says that there's three gods with three persons, three essences, um, it wasn't technically formally condemned until later in church history, um, but there are very clear uh, like inklings in church history that tritheistic language was starting to make its way in, and then it would be squashed, and then it would be coming back, and it would be squashed, and then it was finally formally condemned, I think it was 5th or 6th uh, century. But the Athanasian Creed rejects this as heresy before it even be defined as heresy. Um, and it goes to great lengths to prove the unity in essence and the unique personhood of each person. Um, so there are distinct persons serving distinct roles within the Godhood. So the Father is not the Spirit. Look at chapter, uh, paragraph 13. The Son is not the Father. The Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son. There aren't three fathers, there aren't three sons, and there's not three spirits. None was before the other. They've all existed in Trinity and in unity for eternity past. There's never been a moment in history, or even pre-history, where there wasn't trinity in the Godhood. This is something that has been eternally so. There has always been the Father, there's always been the Son, and there's always been the Spirit, and they have always been united as one essence in three persons. Um, this belief is critical to Christian theology. It's complicated, it is, it is challenging. It's, it's, it's hard to get your head around these things. Um, and I think it's worth meditating on these things for that exact reason. It is difficult to understand God. It should be. It's God. 
Um, but I do want you to understand the logic of this creed. Um, the authors of this creed are establishing that, I think in particular, they're really defining who Christ is in the Godhood. They're really nailing down on Christ is part of this trinity. Um, he is equal. He is eternal. He is, he is equally part sharing in the essence of Godhood. He's the creator of this world, and he shares in that, that fundamental essence of godness. But he is a distinct person. This idea is critical. Unity in essence, trinity in persons. It's critical because it established the foundation of what this creed is, is really about, I think. It's, it's not just about the trinity. I think it sort of treats the trinity as established. What, is, what it's really highlighting um, is answering this, this second question. Um, the first question is how God is Jesus? It's answered that. Every possible metric proves Jesus is God or the Son is God. Every possible standard says that he is God. There's no aspect of the person of Christ that is less than God the Father. He is uncreated, eternal, almighty, in every way, God. But the second question that the creed asks is to what degree is Jesus human? Uh, how human is Jesus? It's not sufficient to merely hold that Jesus is a member of the Trinity. He's equal in deity, in essence, with the Father and the Spirit. But we must also hold that he is fully human. He's fully God, fully human. We see once again how the creeds are written to combat heresy and error from creeping in around the church. The Nicene Creed did this brilliant job of clarifying the distinct relationship between the Father and the Son. Um, the, the Son is begotten, not created. But where it needed just a little bit of embellishment was on the unique nature of Christ. Um, so have a look at, at paragraphs 19 and 20. It says, Now this is the true faith, that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and human equally. He is God from the essence of the Father, begotten before time, and he is human from the essence of his mother, born in time. Completely God, completely human, with a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father as regards divinity, less than the Father as regards human, uh, humanity. Um, so these heresies are being compatible. And what I don't expect you all to do from this morning's sermon is to be able to name and define all of the heresies throughout church history. But what, what I do hope to achieve this morning is to just give the, the most rudimentary foundational sort of rubric for understanding the Trinity so that when someone starts um, sort of expounding something that is, is not quite right, where they start saying, well, you know, God is really just one person, he's just showing up differently, or, you know, Jesus was, was mostly human, or Jesus was just a guy who became God, or, there's, you know, any of the other heresies that have come up, there's more than I can say in one minute, but what I want to achieve is when we start hearing just little inklings of those heresies, to just get a little bell to go off in the back of your head. That's, that's what I'm hoping to achieve. It's just thinking theologically is important for Christians to do because theology is how we understand God and theology is how we understand the gospel. And if we lose theology, we lose the gospel. Um, so that's what I'm hoping to achieve. I hope I achieve that. If not, just read the creed a lot. That should get you somewhere. Um, so when we look, we're going to look at two more heresies, and then we're going to discuss why dabbling in these heresies undermines the fundamental truth and the very nature of the gospel. The first heresy um, that, that this section of the creed is combating is called Nestorianism. Um, Nestorius proposed that Jesus was two separate persons, one divine and one human, dwelling in the same body. So there is God the Son, the divine God, eternal, uncreated, and then there's Jesus, the human, who is created, and he, um, his personhood was created. And so the divine word and the human, Jesus, dwelt in the same body. And what, what functionally what this means, like in practice, is that at some of Jesus' experience, some of his actions were done by the divine person. And then at other times, the human side would take over and, and do bits of things like, you know, Jesus, the human, would be hungry and would suffer and would feel sadness and all those things. But then the, you know, the, the divine nature would take over and, um, you know, he would you know, perform miracles. And, and only the divine nature can forgive. So that had to be Jesus in his divine nature, um, the divine person of Jesus doing those things. 
And so, yeah, that was, that's a heresy that this, this uh, creed really nails down. The second heresy is called Apollinarius, Apollinarianism. So Apollos contended that Jesus had a human body, but really the divine God was just operating that body as sort of like a puppet. Um, it's like uh, if you've watched Avatar, Jake Sully or Jake Sully, um, you know, like he, he sort of transports in into a body, but he's not truly Navi, is he? Well, that's the, the race, is he? He's not really Navi, it's just a human dude operating a, a puppet, essentially. Um, that's, that's what the uh, Apollinarians contended. So Jesus, the divine, didn't really experience human emotions. You know, he didn't have to reason like a human. He didn't have a human soul. He didn't have temptation in the same way or suffer in the same way. But I think the Athanasian Creed nails these two to the wall. If you look at paragraph 21, it says, Although he is God and human, yet Christ is not two, but one. He is one, however, not by his divinity being turned into flesh, but by God's taking humanity to himself. He is one, certainly not by the blending of, of his essence, but by the unity of his person. For just as one human is both rational soul and flesh, so too the one Christ is both God and human. The doctrine being expounded here is the hypostatic union. Hypostatic union, it's a big word, but I think Christians need to, to, to understand this word. I think, it's, I think it's really important that we, we really figure this out because it's important. Um, it's, it's fundamental to the gospel. Simply put, the hypostatic union is the belief that the person of God the Son dwells perfectly in two natures. They are perfectly united in the one person of God without mixing, without changing, without dividing or separating. It's not that he's part God and part human. He's not 50% God, 50% human, or 60% God, 40% human. God the Son is one person. He is fully divine and fully human at the same time. This is a mystery. It's not, I'm not going to be able to explain how it works in perfectness. It's, it is difficult and it's, it's hard to get our heads around. So is the Trinity. It doesn't mean that it's untrue. It is just difficult. Um, his person is both human and God. Um, individually, they are complete, fully complete natures. The divine nature doesn't impinge on the human nature. The human nature doesn't impinge on the divine nature. They operate in unison and distinction within the person of God the Son. It's not like taking blue paint and yellow paint and mixing them together to get green. It's, I'm not sure, I can't exactly explain it in a good analogy. The same happens with Trinity. We fall, and like illustrations fall apart pretty quickly when we start trying to do it. It's easier to define what it's not than what it is sometimes. But we do know that the divine God, God the Son, from eternity past, at, at a point in history, took on human flesh. In mind, in soul, in spirit, he became fully, perfectly human. Um, we see this established in, chapter, in paragraph 21, don't we? Um, and one of the most critical passages in establishing this doctrine is John chapter 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's not that his divine self ceased to be for a time, he added to himself the essence of humanity. Uh, he, God the Son, didn't become less by taking on humanity. He became more. He added to himself the human nature. Um, this fact is central to salvation theology. Without the incarnation, without this hypostatic union, we have no salvation. Um, it's not just fun theology. It's not just theologians trying to grasp difficult things for the sake of grasping them. It is the very essence of the gospel. It's our hope of salvation. Um, so that's why we come to question three. Why does this doctrine matter? Why does he need to be both fully divine and fully human? It's because in the hypostatic union, God is ontologically linked. Um, Jesus serves as this, this bridge between God and humanity. He is able to fully and perfectly identify with God 
And he's able to fully and perfectly identify and represent humanity to God. One of the most prolific writers on this subject is T.F. Torrance. Um, Torrance viewed the incarnation, this God taking on humanity as the core of the gospel. It was a pivotal moment in temporal history. And in history, this happened, which is the coolest thing ever. Um, God stepped into time and into space as a representative of the entirety of humanity. Christ served as this vicarious human. He stood before God as the human representative. Um, this perfect embodiment of the intended relationship with God. But why was it necessary? Why did we need someone to stand before God in this capacity as this perfect representative? Um, this, this points back to the fall. Adam served as our federal head. He, was, he served as our first representative before God. We are, he's our agent, essentially, before God. Adam was the first human. He represented every single one of us. Um, and after him, his actions, his sinful actions, we bear the consequences of that. We, we, we are essentially counted as having committed those sins. Romans 5.12 makes this point clear. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. So through Adam's sin, death came to us all. Both physical and spiritual death entered this world, affecting every single one of us. And since Adam, no one's been pure either. No one has been sinless. Um, Job highlights this idea, this, this universal impurity of the human race. He says in chapter 4, Who can bring what is pure from that which is impure? No one. All humans since the fall of Adam have been tarnished by this sin. We're born, we're even conceived, according to the Psalms, in sin, with sin in our hearts. Adam's role as our representative before God means that his failure is our failure. We are failures before God. We are worthy of death because of that. In Adam, we sinned against a perfect God. Um, Ephesians 2 says, as, you, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. He goes on, we were by nature deserving of wrath like the rest of humankind. We stand before God guilty because of the sin of Adam. I can't overemphasize this point because Adam represented us as, the, as a human. He, he as a human represented us. And so we need a sacrificial representative for us. Someone who has suffered, someone who died and yet lived a sinless life. Scripture is rich with allusions for this need for a representative sacrifice. Uh, we looked at, in our Old Testament series, the Abrahamic story of Abraham and Isaac, where Isaac was going to be sacrificed and then a representative or a, a stand-in came along. It was a ram. Um, but the author of Hebrews makes it clear that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats, and I think we can infer rams, to take away sins. There's a need for a worthy sacrifice We need a perfect representative. Um, we need someone who is holy and blameless. Levitical law makes it super clear that they need to be perfect, without spot, without defect. Uh, but no regular human could stand as a substitute. Everyone bears that mark of sin. We're all sinners before God. None of us are spotless. We would all be a completely insufficient sacrifice to die for anyone else in terms of atoning for sin. McPherson puts it this way, satisfaction can be rendered only by someone who is at the same time God and human. With respect to suffering, of which a divine person is not capable, the subject must be a man. With respect to infinite worth, corresponding to the infinite guilt for which atonement has to be made, the subject must be God, who alone possesses such worth. So what McPherson is highlighting is how the hypostatic union makes salvation possible. Without salvation, it's, it's a hope without substance. Um, we're still guilty. God's justice remains unsatisfied. So he's saying that the divine essence of God, or Jesus, can't experience adequate suffering for sin. It has to be a human that experiences death. For sin to be atoned for, it requires a penalty, specifically death. And the divine, in essence, cannot die. God cannot die. God is immortal. 
So therefore, a, someone to experience suffering and death, the atoning person has to be human, truly human, with a mortal body that can endure pain and suffering with a mortal soul. But the sacrifice must represent humanity. And, and Jesus serves at this. Hebrews 2 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Jesus needed to be human. But a mere human can't atone for sin. Um, infinite sin, like, if, like we have sinned against an infinite God, so there's this infinite death, debt, um, and it requires an atonement of equal infinite worth. The debt is infinite, so we need an infinite sacrifice um, to be worthy. No regular sinful human could achieve this. Only God himself, who possesses the infinite worth, necessary to sacrifice um, to, to pay for that offence. The atoning sacrifice, the atoning person must be fully divine. Um, so the one making atonement must be God. That's the logical conclusion. It has to be human, has to be God. Because God alone is worthy of the sacrifice. So if Christ were just a man, no matter how well endowed by the Holy Spirit, his suffering would have been insufficient to atone for the sins of the world. If he were merely God, he would have been an invalid sacrifice because he couldn't represent humanity properly. To be a valid sacrifice, he needed to be truly and fully human, not just human in appearance. He needed to endure, truly endure suffering and temptation. He needed to submit to the law and perfectly uphold it. He needed to be the perfect example of humanity. He is a perfect representative. And in his death, we're united to him. Um, it allows us to be redeemed and reconciled to God. We're united to Christ through faith. And the coolness of this doctrine, I think, is that it doesn't end with reconciliation. Jesus didn't just die for us. He also rose. The, the creed highlights this idea. And Romans 6 makes it clear and our connection with Jesus doesn't end at reconciliation. It doesn't end with death. We're also united to him in our resurrection. Colossians 2 reinforces this idea by saying that we are made alive by him. Paul explains this even further in 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to get to that next year in our 1 Corinthians series. I cannot wait. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. Um, those of us who believe in Christ... Because he is human, we can point to him and can say, look, he rose. That means I rise. I'm tied to him. He, he's my Lord. He's my king. His resurrection is my resurrection. That's why the hypostatic union is not just some curious bit of theology. It's not just something that's fun or interesting um, or just, just a puzzle to solve. I think it's the, the, the very essence of the reconciliatory work of Christ. Without his deity, we have no gospel. Without his humanity, we have no gospel. Without our union with him, we have no gospel or resurrection. If either of these traits is overemphasized, we lose everything. That's why I think we should delight in the creeds. I think, it's, I think Christians really need to rediscover the value of these documents. Um, because believing in these truths is how we are saved. Like we believe that Jesus died for us and it matters. That's why paragraph 1 and 17 and 18 all highlight that whoever desires to be saved should above all hold to the Catholic or the Christian faith. Anyone who doesn't keep it will perish eternally. This is serious stuff. These truths are the essence of our salvation and resurrection. We can't neglect these truths. We need to defend these truths because if, if we deny or we warp or we mutter these truths, we undermine the gospel. So I encourage you, study these things. I don't think one sermon, I, I, I expect that many of you will leave a little confused. That's okay. Spend some time. That's why it's a handout. Bring it home. Put it on the fridge. Think it through. Google. It's beautiful. 
Um, look at the passages that support these things. There's, there's like th- these documents that we've studied over the last couple of weeks are rich with theological principles founded in Scripture. Look to Scripture to validate what I'm saying today and validate what's in here. It's so important to think through theologically because theology is what um, is how we understand God's work in this world and how we understand our salvation. Um, these are the truths that save us. Like God, the Son, the Eternal, the Majestic, the Infinite, the Awesome, the Uncreated One humbled himself and took on human flesh. He gave up himself. He suffered a humiliating death, a perfect and sinless sacrifice for us. He took on the guilt of the world. He rose so that we might secure our salvation and our resurrection. Those of you who believe might be in relationship with him eternally because of his, this hypostatic union, because of our union with Christ through his humanity, we are assured of our eternal salvation. So if you're a believer, just meditate on these truths as we take communion. Um, just consider the majestic wonder in these Uh, historic documents. If you're not a believer, we we do ask that you remain seated, Uh, but do consider what what is before you this morning. Like us, you you need a saviour. You are guilty. We are guilty. We bear the sin of Adam. You bear the sin of Adam. But in Christ, if you trust in Christ's work, if you trust that he died for you as your representative, just as Adam was your representative, take on Christ as your representative, um, yeah, then you can join us. If you have any questions, I'd love for you to chat with me or Don or Harold after the service or whoever brought you. But for now, I'll pray and then we'll take communion together. Lord God Almighty, uh, the eternal, uncreated one in essence. Uh, Lord, we, we praise you in Trinity. Uh, we, we thank you that um, you have made your son, uh, that you, Father, have sent your son to to be human, to represent us, to join us in our humanity. Uh, Lord, we we thank you that we have a perfect and spotless representative before uh, you. We we thank you that we have a hope of salvation. Um, Help us, Lord, to, to understand these difficult and challenging and overwhelming truths. Help us meditate on them. Help us be are diligent in, in searching your word, that we may not believe um, just for the sake of believing, but that we may believe based on, based on your word. Um, yeah, we ask this in Jesus' good, holy, and righteous name. Amen.